issues. Howdy, everyone. Uh, we should be live on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and we're inviting our guests to join us on Instagram, so we'll see if that happens in the next minute here. But in the meantime, welcome, everyone. It's a new week, and this week we are talking about National Pet Choking Prevention Day, which um, is officially Thursday the 22nd. Um, all right. We're still looking for our guest on Instagram. We will see what happens. Um, so my guest today is Dr. Barry Sands. I met her last year out in California. We were both speaking at an event and um, I was pretty dang impressed. Let me just uh -huh. say. Uh, so you might need to tell her to accept. Uh, do you see an invitation coming up, Barry, on your Instagram? No, I'm on your Instagram. So she's on my Instagram. It says she's unable to join. Okay. All right. So Instagram folks jump over to YouTube or Facebook, please. Cause we can't get Instagram going and that's fine. Okay. So my guest today, Dr. Barry Sands does all kinds of really cool, um, integrative medicine and a lot of energy work, I think. Uh, but I'm going to let her give you more information. But she also happens to be an emergency room clinician, which really fun to be an integrative vet in the emergency room setting. So Barry, thank you for agreeing to join me today. You're yeah, welcome. Yeah. Uh, so give us a little background on who you are, what you do, and uh, what you love about what you do. <laughs> Uh, well, um, as a title, I like to call myself an emergency critical care, integrative functional medicine, holistic veterinarian. Because I do <laughs> <laughs> mouthful. Yeah, that is. <laughs> and, you know, what that encompasses is um, about 30 years of experience and working in private practice, also at a specialty hospital and emergency critical care. I've been doing that for the last 27 years. Wow. Um, I have an integrative practice for the last 20 years wow. um, and all these different modalities, you know, the beautiful things that we get to do in integrative practices like acupuncture and, and light therapies, um, homeopathies, food therapies, nutrition, um, body work, massage, rehab, like all that really cool stuff. Um, I uh, won the Holistic uh, Practitioner of the Year Award last year, 2022. Yay. And I just recently became certified as a Master Practitioner of Shamanic Energy Medicine. How cool. How yeah. cool. And that's for humans and animals. And so I'm just wow. bridging my, my scope to sort of encompass the healing effects of everybody. Because, you know, we're not, we're, we're collectively together on this. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a a human animal relationship. Ultimately. You know, I think that's such an interesting combination and ability because sometimes we see pet owners and I'm sure in emergency medicine, you see it a lot where there is just a ton of anxiety, a ton of fear. Um, and people are just kind of, and I saw it in emergency medicine all the time. If you truly have an emergency, you're usually running in the front door, crying, screaming for help, um, just begging for anybody to get you out of the, the situation that you're, you're in with your pet. Um, and I would think being able to offer some of that energy, calming energy for the client has got one, it's got to make your life a lot easier being able to deal with a person who's a little more calm. And second, it's got to be so much better for the client to be able to kind of be calm and focus, which then helps the animal be calmer. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The, these trainings that I've gotten from, um, I'm, I was also became a certified trainer for the Institute of Heart Math, which oh, right. teaches people how to go into heart brain harmony coherence to just level down your physiology, decrease your sympathetic tone, increase your parasympathetic, just to relax, you know, and, and be present. So in, in that really helped me in helping my clients, um, you know, how to maintain their emotional composure, you know, in the face of this crisis, because it, they exactly. come in in crisis. They do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, being able to keep yourself calm and centered has to be beneficial when you're trying to keep everybody around you calm, you know, your staff and everyone else. And that's, that's, that can be difficult. Um, I know I, I, 
did emergency medicine a lot of years ago. Uh, but sometimes it was so crazy busy and you had so many things stacked up and it just, it can get really nutty. Yeah. Uh, so, but what I wanted to talk about today, because it is National Pet Choking Awareness Day and week, really, um, I wanted to talk about some of the interesting, weird, sad, uh, sometimes joyful choking events that we have seen in practice. And I saw them in traditional everyday practice as well as emergency medicine. So give us an idea of some of the the choking cases that you have seen come in through your emergency service? Yeah, well, you know, choking comes in many different forms. Um, in essence, it's an inability for your airways to, to properly oxygenate your body, right? And so that could be a consequence of an object that's sitting in front of the epiglottis, the larynx, you know, and it's stuck or wedged in there. Something that is um, bigger than that, that's in the mouth and hasn't gone that far, but it's still in the back of the throat. It could be things that are that have passed even the windpipe that have gone into the esophagus and is now lodged in the esophagus, sort of halfway between the, the throat and the heart, creating this very discomforted mechanism. Um, and then there's the choking that happens with uh, things around the neck, physical things around the neck, uh, whether they're collars that are getting caught on things or they're the collars that are getting manually pulled and choked, you know, choking up the animal on a daily basis. You know, all these different levels are, are happening. And I've had Man, a variety of things. Um, I'd have to say off the top of my head, the most interesting for me <laughs> um, choking episode was an actual inhalation of a palm seed. Palm seed. And, <laughs> mm -hmm. and we see a lot of these palm seeds from the palm trees in, in California. And this was a, a, a relatively big dog. So he was able to ingest a seed about the size of a, maybe a half inch round. And he actually inhaled it into his trachea. Wow. And so that was a very um, precarious situation because you, it, it was very timely because you had to get the seed out. Otherwise, if he kept inhaling it, um, it would either get lodged deeper in the in the trachea or go into one of the branches of the bronchi and then seed itself deeper into the lung tissue. And that is just a, a disaster in itself. Did the owner come in knowing that the dog had kind of inhaled that palm seed? Like, did they know what the problem was? He suspected. He said he was eating a bunch of seeds and then all of a sudden he couldn't breathe. Wow. And, and so we... Um, as, as, when, he, when he first came in, you could see that he was mm, partially cyanotic and very, cyanotic means blue and uh, not oxygenating and very frantic. And so yeah. we, you know, we really needed to address this very quickly, um, plate, sedating the dog, getting an IV catheter in him, taking an x-ray, seeing where this thing is at. And that's how we just, we knew it was in the trachea itself. And, um, it was a very masterful coordination of my team to, to implement the success of this situation. It was, it was amazing. And How did you manage to pull it out of there? Well, thank goodness we had a fluoroscopy machine in our clinic because I don't think I'd be able to do it without it. It would have been very difficult. And a fluoroscopy machine is like a live X-ray where you put the animal underneath it and you can see what's happening in a dynamic way. Very so cool. we were using the fluoroscopy and we, the coordination of the event with all like with the four people involved and the fluoroscopy and it took about a, maybe under an hour, we were trying to, you know, oxygenate the dog while we're trying to figure out, you know, basically I said, there is no plan B. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this has to work. And um, because we only had, once we put the dog under anesthesia, uh, and he wasn't going to, there was no way to capture his air. So we had about a minute to remove the foreign body. Wow. So the, the effort, the coordinated effort of everybody's play was really important. 
Um, so, you know, we got all that dialed in and then we're like, okay, go. And we ended up under the fluoroscopy, uh, we passed a, uh, a Foley catheter down into the trachea and then blew the little, we passed, we could see the, the seed and we, we went past the seed. We blew up this balloon on the uh, lower side of the seed. And the, then as that was bigger than the seed, we pulled it out. <laughs> How ingenious. I was thinking you were going to say, okay, we had an endoscope with the little grabbers. How ingenious was, that? I never would have thought of that. Yeah. That our so end, cool. you know, the end, there's not enough room. There was, it's so little, the space is so small. Right. You know, and that also reminded me, I had a, um, recently, this was very difficult. It was a tiny little kitten who um, bit off the tip of the nursing bottle and she inhaled it. But it went, it, it actually went into the upper esophagus. And so it was a little, it was easier to get out because it's in the esophagus um, oh, and we could intubate her for the anesthesia, but it, there was no space in that tiny little mouth. Yeah. No kidding. Oh my gosh. So, oh gosh, those are so, well, good for you. Um, I think my weirdest one, you know, when you're in emergency and you're on the overnight shift, which I was on a lot, um, usually the shifts are like 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. And between 6 and 8 a.m., you're literally just trying to catch up everything that's left over from all night. <laughs> you're trying to go through all the cases in the hospital, make sure that you have all your notes and everything ready so that you can do the handoff to the next doctor coming in. You're getting the, the new technician shift coming in at 7 o'clock. You're getting all of them on board with everything. So the last thing you want is a major emergency to come in the door, like, 40 minutes before you're supposed to leave. Because, right. <laughs> you know, it's like, and I usually had, that was back, I was doing relief work a lot then too. So it was usually like, okay, I'm leaving here at eight. I got to be at the next clinic at nine. And if I get hung up here, I'm in deep doo-doo. So, you know, this guy comes running in the door about 7.15 in the morning and he's carrying about a 90 pound German shepherd who was limp. And I thought, oh my gosh, what is this disaster at 7.15 in the morning? And, you know, everybody's busy trying to catch up from everything overnight. And he came running straight to the back, laid the dog on the table. And I said, what's going on? And he said, I was playing ball with the dog and I was bouncing the, do the, wall the ball off the wall. And as it would come back, the dog would catch it. And it was one of those round, hard rubber balls with the hole in the middle with the bell in it. And when the dog went and caught it, it lodged right into the airway. So completely sealed this dog's airway. Luckily, he lived close by. Um, so I didn't have to sedate the dog because he was already passed out. And he was pretty blue. Uh, cranked his mouth open and looked. And luckily, the hole of the ball was facing me. Oh, nice. <laughs> and so I was able to just get a towel clamp in there and grab hold and pop that thing out of there and the dog get a <gasps> you know, sort of came back to life. And yeah. I mean, but that was, that was, it was all just a miracle. One, that he got there fast enough Two that the ball was facing in a direction that I could actually get a hold of it. Um, but it is amazing. As a matter of fact, uh, we did a, an article for VPN, which is a paid website for veterinarians that came out today, I think. Um, <clears throat> and the picture that they chose for the article is this big bully breed dog with the ball coming straight at him with his mouth wide open. Mm. And the ball is just the right size that, you know, it's going. <sighs> so th that is something I would warn people. If you are playing ball with your dogs, always throw the ball away. So your dog has to chase after it. Do not throw it toward them where they're going to grab and it may go in and always use a ball that's too big to get all the way in their mouth. Um, golf balls are a perfect size to get stuck in the airway of, of oh, meeting yeah. the large breed dogs. I mean, there's so many, so many things that we see. So yeah. give us another couple of weird ones that you've seen. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Um, you know, if you have, it's not always practical to have like huge balls if you're playing ball, right? Because they like the dog to catch the ball, then you then they give it back and they drop it. It's no fun if it's too big to get in their mouth because they're not playing soccer. Right. So my suggestion when with balls in general, anything that when it gets wet is not slippery slimy, 
is better like something like that has a little bit of texture and fur or like even like even those um uh, tennis balls something that that if you had to if it did get stuck and you had to reach in the mouth even with a tool a stick something small to just poke it in and push it out um the slimier and smoother it is the more difficult that's going to be because it's just going to roll out. Yeah. It's just going to keep That's rolling true. as you're trying to grab it. And it, it's better if it has some sort of weird texture, something that you could flick or get around or, you know, so that's a little, you know, pearl right there. I had a, um, a dog come in. Uh, it was a, uh, uh, Cavalier King's Charles dog. And he, uh, was eating dinner and ate too fast. And then he was, he came and he couldn't breathe. And mom, the only didn't know what happened. She thought maybe he asked, had aspiration pneumonia. He was, he tried to vomit. And so he came in and he was obviously had a lot of inhalation, um, couldn't inhale well and actually couldn't exhale either. We looked in his mouth and he had a, just a big chunk of a beef, a beef, big chunk of beef, just right sitting on the top of his larynx. And so it was, it wasn't difficult to get it out. Um, you know, we just took, I just opened his mouth. We took a hemostat. I was like, okay, dog, don't move. <laughs> right. <laughs> we went out to and we just had a couple of beaches opening his mouth. And I went in there with a hemostat, grabbed it and pulled it out. Um, so even having like a little tool, like, a, like that, like a hemostat, yeah. you know, in your, in your bag or in a little ER first aid toolkit, yep. just in case you have to grab something from somewhere. Yep. Yeah, you know, like uh, even in like the um, the tick puller kits, there's little things that you can grab with, but just something to be able to. So if you ha if your pet is having a choking incident at home, first thing you want to do is try to get a look in there and see what the heck they might be choking on. Yeah. Um, somebody asked about uh, doing the Heimlich maneuver and, and that sort of thing. And we are actually going to have someone do a live demo on that on our page tomorrow. So make sure you're tuning in tomorrow for that. Um, so other weird things that I've seen, I had a, so brachycephalic dogs, the short no and cats, the, the short push face guys, like the Cavaliers, they don't have a lot of room in their airway. If you ever open their mouth and look in and you're looking, trying to see their airway, all you're going to see is a lot of folds inside of there and the tongue in the way of everything. Um, I have, English toy spaniels. I open their mouth and I'm like, I can't see anything other than your tongue. That the, the, There's so little room in there. So um, our French bulldogs, Boston uh, terriers, all these short faced breeds are definitely more prone to choking because they just don't have a lot of room in there. So for instance, if they're eating, you know, a chicken gizzard or a piece of beef, that's a little too big. Like if I have meat that I'm feeding, my dogs are raw fed. And if I have meat chunks that are big, I make my husband cut them up for them. Or we run things through the grinder because I have these brachycephalic dogs that a large piece is, is going to get stuck. Mm -hmm. I had a, um, a little Pekingese, I think it was that came in. It was choking on a turnip. The owner was slicing turnip, raw turnip. The dog, one hit the floor and the dog said, yum, and went to inhale it and literally did inhale it. And again, luckily he was getting just enough air by to stay alive. She got to my clinic fast enough that I was able to crank open his mouth and she knew it was a turnip. I mean, at least she could run in the front door and say, he's got a turnip stuck in his throat. So I knew what I was looking for. And yeah. again, pulled the turnip out and dog is like, Thank you. I needed needed some air. Right. So um, let's talk about some of the things that can happen after they choke, because sometimes they may choke on rawhides are notorious for choking. I'm really against rawhides. Um, so sometimes they choke on something and maybe the owner gets it out and they think that everything is fine. Um, but then they might show up at your clinic later on with complications associated with it. So what kind of complications do you see after a choking incident? Yeah. So, um, you know, before I delve into that, it just keep in mind too, that choking doesn't always have to be secondary to like a ball or food or a toy or something. And it's really important to, to understand your dogs, like you were saying, you know, how they eat, you know, what their mannerisms are and what their underlying conditions are as well. You know, like if you have, a um, like an older dog that has some laryngeal paralysis and their airways are already compromised, 
that's not the dog that you want to be playing ball with all the time because if he does get something stuck well then it's just a it's a no-win situation yep. um so you know or if they have underlying you know cardiovascular disease you know or heart disease um you just got to be really mindful about all, all the other things when an animal when there's an obstruction in the airways um there's a secondary phenomenon which happens due to the pressure gradient changes in the thoracic cavity and we call that non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And what that is, is fluid that builds up outside the alveoli, outside those little uh, sacs of, of air exchange, gas exchange in your lungs, um, and the bloodstream in between there, there's a lot of congestion and there's fluid that builds up. And so that there's no, it is not a, a good way for gas to exchange, you know, carbon dioxide and oxygen is compromised. And there is unfortunately not a lot of good um, th conventional therapies for non-cardiogenic edema, except for oxygen support. You know, the medical community the, the Western conventional medical community, you know, says, well, you know, it's self that the repair is self-limiting, meaning that usually within, you know, I don't know, 18, 24, 36 hours, the body's going to heal itself, right? You just need to give it oxygen and support. Um, but what is happening inside the lungs during that time period, uh, there is a lot of vascular um, uh, integrity that is broken um, and there's a lot of leaking of the membranes of the vessels. Uh, there's a lot of fluid shifts going on in the wrong places, secondary to the pressure gradients. You know, you inhale something and you're trying to cough against an expanded chest and then everything just goes awry. <laughs> you know, the blood is flowing in the wrong place. This air is, is hitting itself against the wrong pressure gradients and then things weaken. Um, so there's a lot of uh, reperfusion injury like uh, antioxidants, you know, that or oxidation just uh, is formed um, and the vasculature membrane is disrupted. And so in, in integrative medicine, we have ways to help with stabilizing those, those cell membranes better. Um, those endothelial membranes, there are Chinese herbs that you can use and you can use these things rectally. You don't have to put anything in the, in the, down the throat. Cause obviously if they're choking, you're not gonna, they're not gonna wanna eat that they're trying to breathe and you're not gonna put anything orally, you know? Right. So, so they're getting injectable things or, or you can use, you know, herbs rectally to help. Um, yeah. So, so that's the thing, like your pet may have a choking incident and you think, okay, good. Got through that. No problem. And then a little later on, you're like, Oh, who looking. Right. And this could happen a few, within a few hours after the event, like right. he's, he'll seemingly seem fine. And then all of a sudden the breathing will become labored. Yep. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's just, it, we see so many of these incidents. Like I saw them even when I wasn't in emergency medicine, just in my regular practice, I would see them. I had a client whose cat got tangled up in its collar. It, it had gotten outside, got tangled up in its collar, choked itself and died because of the collar twisting. We see it with um, wand toys that we play with, with cats, with the strings. A lot of times people will just tie them to a doorknob and it's got the feathers and the long elastic string and the cats are playing with it. And the next thing you know, the cat's hanging from it. So um, it, it really, our goal with the National Pet Choking Awareness is to one, raise awareness and two, decrease the incidence of yeah. these things occurring because there are about 200,000 incidents of pet choking per year. They don't all result in death. If you're very lucky and you have an emergency service close by or you're able to dislodge the whatever the choking problem is, um, then hopefully you have a good outcome. But unfortunately for some of these animals, even if they do survive, first of all, there's an emotional toll for the owner, which is just devastating. So avoidance is much better than dealing with that after the fact. Um, but there's also a huge financial toll if your pet ends up at the emergency service under sedation with a whole team figuring out how to get a palm seed out of a dog's throat 
I mean, I, I, I have, I have to imagine that that client was so grateful, but I have to also imagine that that client had a pretty good bill. Uh, yeah, you know, it was, he didn't have to stay overnight and it was one of those, it was less expensive than the one that, that is, has the non-cardiogenic edema that's in oxygen for a day and a half. Yeah. You know, that their bill is a lot more expensive than this procedure is a procedure anesthesia. And then it was, as soon as you get it out, he's, the dog is fine. The guy goes home (laughs) and then, and everybody (laughs) is grateful. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and if you make it look too easy, you know, I don't really, you don't get the like, oh my God, that was, I was like, you don't understand how amazing that actually was. Yeah, that was amazing. (laughs) He was like, yeah, thanks doc. Have a good day. And I'm like, yeah, right. Yes. Okay. All good. See you. You know, hope not to see you next week. Yeah. Another thing too, for, you know, for the, well, we can get talked to the expense about things, but one of the things that came to mind about awareness was having dogs in the back of trucks that are not harnessed effectively I've seen a lot of dogs that have collars on with leashes that are in the back of the truck, and then they decide to to jump off the truck. And I've had many of these dogs come in that have been strangled and being dragged as because they don't know that the dog jumped out. Exactly. Exactly. And then they hear banging or whatever. And then the dogs come in. If they survive, they come in with, you know, a lot of, you know, neck injuries, they'll come in with um, wounds on their feet because if they're trying to run against the, the car. I had one dog who had the leash that was around the neck and got caught underneath his arm um, and almost severed, you know, virtually all the muscles were gone in the arm. Oh my gosh. Um, it, they had, I can't it, believe that's not illegal. I mean, in some states, I think when I lived in New Jersey, I think it was illegal. I don't know if it's illegal here, but when I see dogs in the back of trucks, I, I literally want to pull the person off the road and, you know, shake them and say, yeah. what, <laughs> what is wrong with you? Like, yeah. why does this seem like a good idea? Um, I mean, they have these, all these new mechanisms where there's a harness and you can put it, you can hook them in like in four points. So they're just like in the middle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. there's, oh my gosh. That is so crazy. Hey guys, is my um, power cord plugged in? Cause it's saying I'm really low and I'm in energy saving. I'm thinking I'm not plugged in. Yeah, I'm not. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my screen just brightened up. How about that? <laughs> so, so one of the things, uh, one of the reasons this pet choking awareness day came to be is because the folks at um, Bowwell Labs have these really cool and. Barry wasn't aware of these before we went live. They have these really cool gadgets, and this is called the Bowwell Buddy. Spin it around the bow wow buddy so it has this hole in the middle and it has uh little teeth in there kind of hard to see and in this this end there's this little screw and what it does is there's a thing in the middle so you put your long-term chew in there whether it's let me get that into whether it's a bully stick or whatever and the little teeth hold it and then this grabs hold and locks it in there so because one of the things that they like to do and i was talking about we had dogs during our office meeting today and these come in different sizes depending on whether you have big dogs little dogs um and a couple of the dogs were chewing on ram horns which i really like as a long-term chew because they they break down in little bits instead of big chunks breaking off and they don't soften up so that they can try to swallow them but both dogs were down to these little end pieces and they were both at the size where i could just see like one of the dogs looked at the other dog and they, you know what happens when you want to get something away from them? You say, drop it and they go. Mm-hmm. And so I'm just picturing this as we're talking about pet choking awareness. I'm like, oh my gosh. So, you know, I thought, well, you know, if, if we're going to let these dogs continue to chew on these smaller pieces, we're at the point where they need to be locked in something so that they cannot swallow that last piece. Because one of the problems that we see with things like rawhide, they're, they're not digestible. So, and if it's sitting in the esophagus or partially blocking the airway, your dog is going to be pretty darn miserable trying to get that out of there. You're going to have a lot of trauma and a lot of swelling and edema in the airway um, and, and hope that you notice before they succumb to what they're doing. And I used to feed these, um, these, uh, they were called Texas taffy. 
and they were basically pressed beef muscle that was dried. And so they were about the size of a Turkish taffy that, you know, we would eat as a kid. And my dogs loved them. I'm like, well, what could be wrong with this? They're just chewing some dried beef. The only problem is they would chew it, and I have brachycephalic dogs, they would chew it, soften it up, and then try to swallow a 10-inch long piece of beef. It never turned out well. I, every single time, had to pull these out of their throats. It, I don't know why it took me so long to stop feeding them, other than they loved them, and I was like, well, you know, I'll just keep pulling them out. But why put your dog in that position, and God forbid you turn your back at the wrong time? And so that's another take home. Don't ever give your dog a long term chew and walk out of the house, particularly yeah. if your dog has separation anxiety or your dog may be chewing. The mailman shows up and the dog is all of a sudden jumps up and happens to gulp when they're jumping up. Um, you know, if nobody's there to to be aware of what they're doing and how they're chewing. Yeah, it can be yeah. disastrous. I think it's important to, you know, know your dog's chewing behaviors you know, how they like to chew things um, and know, you know, what would be the more appropriate thing for them to chew on and, and have them supervised, you know, honestly, because I had this one, um, a Doberman who he wasn't, didn't choke on it through his airways, but he, it was a, um, like one of those little knuckle bones, really hard. And he ended up um, swallowing it it was just big enough for him to swallow it. And then it got stuck midway in his esophagus. And oh, this God. bone was so, it was so dense and so heavy um, that when we tried to do endoscopy, so this is where a case would be able to try to do endoscopy, like put, you know, uh, put them under anesthesia, intubate them, and then take the endoscope and try to get in there to the esophagus and pull this thing out. It was so wedged in to the esophagus, um, also because it was there, it was probably there for about a half a day before the guy even realized that there was a problem. Ooh. So there was a lot of inflammation. We didn't want to tear the esophagus. Yeah, it became a, a, such an ordeal that the we the dog ended up having to have abdominal surgery, where we had to do um, go in through the stomach and then reach in through the stomach to go up the other side. Like we had to come at this thing from both angles. Oh my gosh. To get it to move into the stomach so that we can pull it out through the abdominal incision. It was a massively big deal. Oh my God. Yeah. There's an expensive big deal. <laughs> yeah. And I'm pretty sure that this dog never had anything to eat like that ever again in its whole life. I mean, he did survive. It did. The recovery was, was very long, very expensive. Oh my gosh. I, I can't I've even never imagine seen like that since, but, but it is, it is amazing. Like in, in the vet journals every year, they have the, the x-rays of the, I can't believe the animal swallowed that and literally x-rays of steak knives and <laughs> choker collars and leashes. Yeah. It's like, how did they get that down? Yeah. So, I mean, you give them a chance and they're, they're going to figure out how to swallow something that they really, really shouldn't oh yeah i had a i had a boxer come in and mom was giving him some peanut butter on a spoon and he inhaled the spoon he the spoon was now in the dog's esophagus <laughs> with the peanut butter so it's like even things like that you don't think about you're like oops you know there goes my spoon and oh gosh Oh, all right. That's, you know, my dogs are going to eat baby food from now on. <laughs> it's like you're getting nothing. So people are asking a lot of questions about, you know, is this okay? Is that okay? Um, and because we are raw feeders, we do feed a lot of weird things like chicken feet and duck feet and chicken necks, turkey necks, duck necks. And the thing is, is it too small or too large for your pet? That's going to be an individual decision for every one of them. I would never give any of my dogs. Now I remember I have small dogs with small airways. Um, I would never give any of my dogs something like a neck or a foot to chew on unless I was right there and I was holding onto one end of it. Um, I, the last thing I want is one of my dogs to decide that he can swallow that chicken neck. And so I have a hold of the other end. Um, we have a Cocker Spaniel. He's a 30 pound dog. He's got a big mouth, real big teeth. So I'll give him things like a dried 
duck head, which he crunches that and it breaks apart into little bits and that's good. Um, but even him, I know his chewing style. I would be worried about something like a duck foot with him because I could see him chewing it just enough to soften it up and trying to gulp it down. So it really is. And even for kitty cats, some kitty cats will just kind of sit there and gnaw on something and others are sort of like, I'm going to steal that and I'm going to go hide from everybody and I'm going to try to gulp it down. So you, you have to know your animal. And so don't ever just give them something new and walk away. Yeah. Always supervise sure. um, and, yeah. you know, keep a hand on it. Mm -hmm. Like my, my dog is, is he eats more like a surgeon. He's very <laughs> meticulous. Oh, you cool. know. <laughs> Uh, he is not a gulper by any means. He just, he likes textures and crunchies and makes things small. So when I do give, and he's about 40 pounds. And when I give him a, uh, a long nose dog, sort of like Terrier Belgian Malamar Greyhound mix kind of dog. And he, uh, if, when I give him those chicken necks, you know, he will, I, I watch him and he's just very meticulous, you know, almost like vertebrae by vertebrae. Very cool. Yeah. It'd be and nice so, if all dogs were like that. Yeah. It's, so he's not like the crazy gulper, you know, but yeah. if he was, it, that definitely would not be my choice yeah. of that. And, and you know, I think, about, about, I think you also have to know if you have multiple dogs in the house and you've got somebody who is food aggressive, you may have everybody gulping. As a matter of fact, right. we've had our mule and our pony choke in the past month because the draft horse, when we put the food out, the draft horse is running from bowl to bowl trying to steal everybody's. Mm -hmm. So the others are gulping. And so this is not just a small animal thing. I, my pony choked. And then about a week, month later, the mule did the same thing. So now we know who can eat together and who can't eat together. Um, so that's another thing. If you have multiple animals in the household and there's going to be competition for whatever it is that they're eating, be very, very careful because that does result in gulping. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, one, I have a question. Like, how did you, how did you help your, your horse? With the choking. Well, they're really interested. So what they're doing is they're getting a ball of food stuck in the esophagus. So it's not in the airway, it's in the esophagus, but it occupies enough space that it's also pressing on the airway. Horses can't vomit. So even if they want to get it up, they can't. They can't go in that direction. So it has yeah, nowhere like to go. Or push yeah, it, like, there's no way, like... no way to go except down. Um, so what happens is everything starts coming out their nose and they stretch their neck going and they drool a lot um so the pony i walked her a lot and massaged her throat a lot while i was waiting for the vet to come because of course it was after hours um and you know the vet got there about an hour later and by then she actually had cleared it but i had them tube her anyway to make sure that there was nothing left the mule happens to be I, you probably don't know the story of all of our crazy rescue animals but the mule happened to be the murder mule She's called the murder mule because when she was at the kill pen, she's an old Amish work draft mule who had been so abused that she was literally trying to kill men who would get near her at all because she had just had saddle sores and girth sores and bit sores. And she, she had been so abused and she was so lame. So at the kill pen, they were trying to round her up. And of course, being Yahoo cowboys, she said, I don't think so. So she would turn around and charge them and kick them and bite them. And so they were going to kill her because nobody could get near her and she was trying to kill people and they thought she was dangerous. And my daughter said, if you can get that mule on a trailer and drop her off at our farm, we'll take her. We'll take her. Yay. Mm -hmm. So we've had the mule for almost two years. And sometimes my daughter can pet her face and a little bit of her neck. Sometimes she can get a halter on her. Well, when she was choking, you couldn't do any of that. So literally for her, it was, you are going to have to work this out yourself right. or you're going to have to get so cyanotic that you fall down and then we can do something. Uh, but she worked it out herself. Thank God. Yeah, that's, that's where the power <laughs> of prayer comes in. <laughs> it, it was really one of those, like, I'm just going to stand here and watch you and, you know, make sure you're safe. Uh, but she really is our, our veterinary, our equine vets are like, yeah, there's this set of equine vets that they will come dart them with sedation. And I'm like, well, if that's what it takes, that's what it's going to take. It's, it's and that's so sad. In, in all my career, I, I have never seen a cat ch coming in choking. I mean, cats I are good. Like I've I never think seen that. cats are more likely to choke on collars. 
Um, yeah, I think all those kind of things are more external as opposed to external. I eat something and I can't, yeah. you know. Cats are much, like I've seen my cats kind of like, especially my barn cats who eat everything. Um, I've seen them kind of doing the, and then it just, yeah. <laughs> like they're, they're they, very good they at They have a good it. propulsion of stuff, <laughs> of air that comes out. They do, however, swallow things, you know, they eat stuff. They have toys that are going down there and. You know, the little mice at the end of the string toy um, yep. get stuck and little hooks and threads and yep. all things. So. Yeah, but I do find with cats, it's more usually an external choking episode, you know, a string that's wrapped around them. As a matter of fact, I was playing with one of my cats the other day and it was a long snaky type toy and I kind of threw it, you know, for him to go chase it. And what did it do? Somehow it lassoed him around the neck. And I was like, what are the chances of that happening? And my husband was standing right there. He's like, I don't think you really meant to wrap that around the cat's neck. I'm like, nope. And then no, I just picked it up trash. and put it in the trash. Because I was just like, you know what? We are just not taking this risk. Yeah. Um, so yeah. even and those, those animals, too, that go outside in and out, in indoor outdoor animals that have collars around their necks, right? You mentioned this before, is they, you know, these little collars, although they're good for identification, they can get caught on surfaces and they can, you know, hang themselves up. Yep. You know, we've seen those kind of things come in. Um, you know, also to those prongy choke collars that are being used for training purposes, you know, are just, they're never okay. You know, there's always a better way to, to deal with an animal, to train it. And aside from pulling in, you know, on the, the structures, there's so many important structures in the neck that we're not, that we don't think about. Even, even when I have a, I don't even like any dogs walking around without a harness. Um, you know, because if they're, even if they're on a, a collar, the client says, oh, my dog never pulls, but every dog pulls. Well, they sure. Pull. If they get scared or they see something that they just can't resist. Yeah. Um, or if they're all just my guys are in there and you're just, they're just going a little bit like this and yeah. you're, it's a little bit, but yeah. what you're doing is you're compressing all those important structures. You have your, your vagus nerve that's coming up that innervates your larynx. You have your carotids, um, arteries that are innervating the blood flow to your head, right? You have your cervical spine, um, all of these important structures that are constantly being manipulated and damaged slowly, much, much better. Yep. To not yeah, that's what, uh, with doing chiropractic work, you could tell which dogs are on a collar and which way they're pulling. <laughs> it's like, oh, your neck is out of whack. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, uh, Barry, thank you very much for your time today. And thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, you you are amazing. I hope you want to do it for another 20 years because it's hard to find good people. Uh, so we've been talking about um, the craziness with the veterinary profession right now and the shortages and all that. Does your emergency service ever have to go on... Um, diversion where you have to send people elsewhere because you're too backed up oh yeah yeah we we okay. do we have we I, I think since covid because the emergency room has been so um available right all these other practices were either too um i don't know some practices were even closed and right. they just diverted everything to the er's um so we were getting at least two three times more clients coming in um, that we can handle. And now because of all this, the year that the years that have gone by, I think there's a lot more staff that are just being exhausted mm -hmm. and they just don't want to work anymore. You know, there's just this morality thing that is, is depleting everybody. And so we definitely have less staff. Mm -hmm. um, we have, you know, the veterinarians that show up, but we're always full. Our cages, we have cages that are full. And so our policies are, um, depending on the level of our fullness in the ER and the staffing, um, we have policies that if you're, if you're dying and you're showing up at the door, you will always come in. You know, That's if you're, good. if you're seizuring, if you're choking. That's you, good. Cause there's a lot of services that won't even do that. <laughs> no, like we'll never turn anybody away in that. And even if we, even if we just don't have, there's always room for one more critical patient on some level, you know, cause right. we triage things well. Right. You know, and there's levels of, you know, who's dying in the next minute, who's dying right. in the next 10 minutes. Who's if you have an ear infection, hour. get to the back of the line. <laughs> right. And I always tell people that, you know, when you come to the ER, 
the longer you wait, the healthier you are. So be yeah. grateful for the long wait time. You never want to be the first one seen in the ER because that means you're dying, you know? And, and <laughs> That's a good, good way to look at it. Yeah, it's like, oh, well, great. I'm so glad I waited like eight hours to be seen, <laughs> you, you know? And so we do, we, we do see the critical patients um, coming in. And those, obviously, the critical ones are the ones that are choking, right? Those are the number ones on the list. If you're blue, you're coming in yeah. and we're doing, you know, and they'll also too with choking, we didn't talk about this, but that lends itself to having hypothermia, right? Heat stroke yeah. right? because they can't regulate their body temperature. And so, you know, I had two cases come in just this weekend. One was exactly like that. The dog was just a little, little anxious, barky dog that was barking for hours and hours and hours on end. And then mom didn't quite know how to handle the situation. And then she took the dog out for a run. <laughs> it was a Pomeranian. I don't know where she was running, you know, but he came in, his larynx was completely edematous and he wasn't able to breathe because it was so inflamed and his body temperature was 108 degrees. Oh my gosh. So he was, you know, in a crisis. He actually ended up doing quite well, you know, within you know, we got him cooled and fluids and meds and everything. So he did, he did really, really well. Um, but that's something to be mindful of. You know, if it's really hot, don't go running with your dog. That's already anxious. Um, oh it, we, I had another, a little old dog that had already heart disease and she was a 13 year old Chihuahua, you know, the ones that have no teeth and their tongue is hanging out like six inches from the I have one of those. <laughs> yeah. So this little dog, for whatever reason, I don't know, she took it swimming in the lake. I don't know. Maybe it's a thing that he liked to do, but she said he was in the lake and then I guess his harness was on and maybe the harness got really heavy and wet and then the dog sang. <laughs> oh my gosh. And so he um, ended up inhaling a lot of the water from the lake. So he had his, you know, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema from aspiration of, of fresh water, you know, oh. plus he had heart disease. So that didn't really help his situation. Oh my gosh. Oh my so he was hospitalized in, in oxygen. And so there's all these confounding factors that go on that we don't really yeah. think about. Like what's your yeah. underlying disease and should you really be doing that? Yeah, that is true. And you wouldn't think that, you know, a chihuahua swimming, I don't even think of them as swimming, but a chihuahua swimming truly ended up being a choking event, but he was choking because he had so much swelling in there. So think about that as we're heading into summer and humidity, folks. Like, don't take your short-nosed dogs outside uh, in the heat racing around. Oh, yeah. Lord. Yeah. So awareness is awareness is 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 my favorite, my favorite friend. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? <laughs> to teach people to just be mindful, be mindful of the kind of dog you have, the way it likes to chew, how it chews, right? And underlying conditions, what their physicality is, you know, they're not, bulldogs are really not athletes. And I've seen, <laughs> though, I've seen, I've seen surfing bulldogs. I've seen them know. surfing. I've seen them doing agility. I have to laugh, but that, they do it. And yeah. it's great. Just make sure you have air conditioning. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe some <laughs> reparative surgery, I'm, you know, to <laughs> make sure they can breathe. Oh Lord. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Barry. We appreciate your time. I know how busy you are. We are so appreciative of our doctors who are working on the front lines in emergency. And I love that you do integrative emergency medicine because that is so unheard of it is yeah. so cool. So, so cool. Thank All right. You. Hopefully our paths will cross, cross again soon. Everyone, please tell your friends to watch the video and be mindful of choking awareness and let's not have these choking incidences continue to occur. Thanks, Barry. You're welcome.